and commanded us to engross ourselves in the words of the Torah. Barukatah Yehovah Eloheinu Melech Haralem Asher Kishanu Bemisvatah Vetzibenu Lo Asak Ben Verei Torah. Please, Yehovah, make the Torah's words sweet in my mouth and in the mouth of all your people, the house of Israel. May we, your children, all of Israel, know your name and the name of your Messiah, Yeshua. And may we study your Torah simply because it is good. Blessed are you, Yehovah, who gave us the Torah of truth. Remain standing as we read from the book of Genesis, Genesis 12, 1 through 4, Isaiah 35, 8 through 10, and then Matthew 7, 13 and 14. <clears throat> now, Yehovah said to Abram, get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make your name great, and you are to be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, but I will curse anyone who curses you, and by you all the families of the earth will be blessed. So Abram went, as Jehovah has said to him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. A highway will be there, a way called the way of holiness. The unclean will not pass over it, but it will be for those whom he guides. Fools will not stray along it. No lion or other beast of prey will be there traveling on it. They will not be found there, but the redeemed will go there. Those ransomed by Jehovah will return and come with singing to Zion. On their heads will be everlasting joy, and they will acquire gladness and joy, while sorrow and sighing will flee. <laughs> Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Go in through the narrow gate, for the gate that leads to destruction is wide, and the road is broad, and many travel it. But it is a narrow gate and a hard road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Bo hapetach hatsa ki rachab hatach umrau hat derek vecha abadon virabi mashe yabo bo vetsa hametach umatza derek vichaim umatim he ashe yimsua. So blessed are you, Yehovah, our God, King of the universe, who gave us a tour of truth, set everlasting life in our midst, and blessed are thou, Yehovah, the giver of the life. Amen. Give someone a hug to your left and then to your right and then have a seat. If no one to your left or your right, I'm sorry. <coughs> you can come to the tables if you want. The tables are always open during this time of this 52 weeks of leadership. So the table is for you to come and enjoy the convenience of taking notes if you want. <coughs> We've been plowing our way through the Torah portion. We're in week three, lesson three. The first uh, lesson we learned was personal responsibility and also moral responsibility. Last week we learned about collective responsibility, correct? And today we're going to learn <coughs> how to have courage not to conform. How to have courage not to conform. You know, there are very, there's a lot of different important principles that we find in the Word of God. And when we look at this Torah portion in Genesis chapter 12, Verses uh, 1 through chapter 17 and 27, but we're going to be looking at uh, 12, 1 through 4. We have to learn a lot of different principles dealing with leadership. <coughs> One of those principles is the distinction between leadership and authority. You know, there is a difference. A lot of times people think if you're an authority, then you're a leader. That's not always so. Or if you're a leader, you have authority. So we have to look at that and understand the difference before we really get into Lech Lecham, dealing with um, <coughs> Genesis chapter 12. 
Authority is something that you have in virtue of office. I stand here in, with authority. I have an office. I am, <coughs> I am Pastor Jeff Myers, the pastor of this house. Or a position that you hold in the family. You are a mother. You are a father. You are in and have authority in that house. That means the children come to you as an authority figure. You can have one in the community. You can sit here as ministers or deacons or elders or whatever. You can have it in society. Maybe at your work you're a manager or, or someone who's in charge of somebody or a lot of people. So you have this authority. That authority is given to you because of position. You probably went in, especially... Um, <coughs> as a person of the job, and you, you, know, you said, I want to have this job, and they looked at you, and they gave you that job, and so therefore, you walked out of that office saying, I am now an authority. Uh, we have, uh, you know, get married, have children, and whoops, there we go, we have some children, guess what? We are an authority. Whether we are ready for it or whether we are not, we are an authority figure. Whether we are a president or prime minister, whether we are um, chief executives, whether we're a team captain, whether we are mother or father, all of those positions have authority, but they do not necessarily lead. They have authority, but not necessarily lead. They can be unimaginable or <coughs> defense. They can resist change even when it's clear that change is needed. Because just because you're an authority doesn't mean that you're willing to change. You might have a syndrome called... PRC, people resist change. If you were here last week, we have come to the conclusion we have those syndromes. We refuse. It's hard for us to change. One of the examples is Pharaoh. Pharaoh was an authority, wasn't he? He, <coughs> he was an authority that was feared, an authority that had uh, great uh, gravity in his authority. But long after it had become clear that his refusal to let the Israelites leave and that them not leaving is bringing disaster upon the people, he continues to refuse. So he's someone in authority, but not someone who is leading, because if he was leading, he would have heard also the voice of God and let them what? <laughs> and let them go. And the end would not have been his destruction. Correct? So conversely, one can lead then without authority. So you can have authority and not be a leader, and you can also lead without authority because you could be sitting here and not have a position, but yet have a leadership position where people are watching you and following you. <clears throat> As parents, we know that sometimes we have our children have friends, and we know if those friends are leaders, and we have to be careful with our friends who hang around people who are leaders because they will lead them the wrong way, right? So uh, naturally, there are, there are those who are leaders in, the, in a community. There are those who are more followers in the community, ones who will get up and start and people will follow them or people who wait to find out who's moving forward. That example is David and Goliath. David was a leader. Did he have any authority at that moment? <coughs> None at all. But he arrives on the scene and he sees that the authority is not doing anything. He sees everyone scared and he leads even though he has no authority. So the word reveals to us that we cannot leave everything to divine intervention. I want to say that again. Because all oh, let it be the Lord's will. Well, there's a lot of things that are the Lord's will. <coughs> and there's a lot of things that he would like for you to step in and do something. David could have came and said, well, it's the Lord's will that Goliath be standing there. And it's the Lord's will that these guys would be hiding behind the rocks. And it's the Lord's will that Saul would be scared to death. But he decided, who is going to let this Goliath defile our God? And then he co-labored with God, didn't he? If you want to say that, he'd be partnered up with him <coughs> to take a leadership position. Yehovah needs us to act so that he can act through us. Get that. None of you woke up this morning and waited for him to drag you out of the bed and Start your car and carry you to the car. You, you know, if you if you know this is a Sabbath, you come on the Sabbath. It's you come and you act with him. Correct. I mean, that would be great if he just forced us to do things that we were supposed to do. Right. But then <coughs> we wouldn't be uh, people of faith. We wouldn't be people that chose to, uh, choose to love him. So faith does not mean leaving everything to Jehovah. Get it. Faith does not mean leaving everything to Jehovah. Does Jehovah know everything? Is Jehovah in charge of stuff? But he's still waiting for us, isn't he? 
He calls Abraham. Abraham, I want you to leave. But, but does he force Abraham to leave or does Abraham have to extend and decide to follow what God wants? He has to follow. We see it in Jonah, right? Jonah, I want you to go to Nineveh. No, I don't think so. He goes the opposite way. And God said, you have a choice to go the opposite way. However, when you go the opposite way, there are some things got to happen to you, right? Because I really want you to do this. And therefore, <coughs> because I want you to do it, and I know really in your heart that you want to do my will, but you're being stubborn right now. I don't know what issues you were having with Nineveh, but I don't get it. But guess what? I'm going to work with you. <coughs> I'm not going to stop you right where you are. I'm just going to be very inventive and create something that's going to turn you around. Isn't that going to be wonderful? Listen, listen. <coughs> faith does not mean that you leave everything to Jehovah. If you're sitting here waiting, we talked last week about protest, right? So that means you have to speak a word of protest sometimes in people's life in order for, for you to have a voice in their life. If you just sit back and say, well, God has to talk to them, you are the voice of God. That's like saying you went by and someone's starving. Well, God will have to feed them. Well, he sent you by them, right? And you happen to have a combo in your hand. Oh, I'm going to pray for you that God feeds you. No. <coughs> Faith does not mean leaving everything to Yehoah. It is not what Yehoah does for us that changes the human situation. It is what we do for Yehoah. Did you get that? It is not what Yehovah does for us that changes human situation. It is what we do for Yehovah. So as we look at the biblical Judaism, I like to say biblical Judaism because some people get freaked out when we just talk about <coughs> Judaism itself. So I want you to know the word. When I say biblical Judaism, I mean the word, what the word says. When we look at biblical Judaism, when we look at the word of God, what God is telling us, we see it is about leadership by influence. Everyone say that leadership by influence. <clears throat> That's wonderful that you're an authority. All right. That's wonderful that you are a leader, but you have to be a leader with influence. It's not about authority in virtue of a formal office. Many people are authorities, but they have no influence. Parents, what does God say to you as a parent? Does he say the mere being a parent makes you a leader? No. What does he say? Train up a child in the way he should go. What does that mean? Be someone of influence, right? <clears throat> and at the end of the day, they will make their own choices. But at least they have someone who has influenced their life. You can be the authority. We say it things like this. You will listen to me because I'm your mom. I, you will listen to me because I am your dad. And should they listen to you because you're mom and dad? Yes. Because you're the authority? Yes, honor your mother and father, and you will have what? Long life. That's why I'm living to 120, because I honor my mom and dad. <laughs> Young people, you're going to have a short life sometimes. I don't know. <clears throat> I'm just telling you. Scripture be true, you're going to have a short life, right? I'm going to outlive you. I'm, I'm going to be 120, and I'm going to be burying people because I honor my mother and father. But let me tell you this. <clears throat> just because I'm honoring my mother and father, I'm honoring their authority. But God wants them to be more than authority. He wants you to be more than authority. He wants you to be a leadership by influence. Another distinction is between leadership as a gift, a talent, a set of characteristics, because, again, <clears throat> we have people who are seem to be people who have a natural talent or an ability to be a leader, right? Or a leader as a process through which we acquire the skills and experience that it takes to influence other people, which these qualities of character <coughs> have to be uh, created in your life. You have to make room for them. You have to make space for them. Right. So even if it's not part of your character, if you want to say it that way or not your talent or ability, it can you can still be groomed to be a leader with influence. Right. Because we're just a, a, a blob of clay that can be molded in in many ways. Right. <coughs> even though we're dirt, we're clay. Aren't you glad that God kind of changed that? He made us out of dirt, but he made us also clay because dirt you can't really do anything with. But clay, you can you can mold it. So whether you are naturally born, if you want to say that as a leader, or you're just someone who has to have those principles implemented in your life, the power of it or the point is, <clears throat> and when we're going to look at this 
Abraham is that God wants us to be a leader with influence. We see often in the Torah that people grow into leadership rather than being singled out from its birth, which we should be excited about it because that means there's hope for us, right? Joseph and Judah, for example, they, they, they both grew in leadership. Uh, <clears throat> we find only in Egypt, after many shifts of fortune, does Joseph actually become a leader. Testings and trials. So if I ask you before I said that, how many want to be a leader, you raise your hand and there, <laughs> there would have to be some testings and trials. <clears throat> there has to be some shifts of fortune. And only after several trials do we actually even see then Judah become a great le a leader. Moses also undergoes a series of personal crisis before he emerges as a powerful leader. He becomes a leader and teacher, but not after great um, heartache, great struggle, right? Leadership is not a gift with which we are endowed at birth. It is something we acquire in the course of time. So if you're still living, you still have time. And often <coughs> that leadership ability comes after many setbacks, many failures, many disappointments. That's the power of those things, why we should count it all joy for the simple reason it is honing us and making us a better authority, a better leader, a leader by influence. If I knew then what I know now, our lives would be different. Correct? So we come to <coughs> the Torah portion where the first verse says, go forth yourself. All right. And Genesis, do I have it up here? Genesis chapter 12, verse one. He wants us to be uh, leaders that lead. Now, Yehovah said to Abram, get yourself. He didn't say, let me get you out. Right. He didn't say, come to the corner. I'm going to meet you and an angel is going to meet you. It's going to be Gabriel. He's going to give you the directions. Psst, psst. Come here. He said what? <coughs> get yourself, which means what? You have now a decision to make. I'm going to tell you what I want. I'm going to tell you your calling. I'm going to tell you what the destiny will be. I'm going to tell you that where you are is not your station in life. What I'm going to tell you is that I have something greater, something more powerful for you. What I'm going to tell you is that you spent a, a lot of time here in this place, and that was good. I used you, and, 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 I, and I groomed you, but now you have a decision. Get yourself out of your country, away from your kinsmen, and away from your father's house, and go to the land that I will show you. Why? Why is that important? Now listen, <clears throat> that does not mean to say that they do not follow, but what they follow is different from what people follow as leaders. Leaders will lead, but it doesn't mean we don't follow. We just follow differently. And so now we have this get yourself out. And so he wants him to go out. And what he's saying is, Listen, <clears throat> you're going to have to make a change in your life. Now, I'm not preaching this sermon to say, oh, I lived in Blackstone all my life. I got to get out. Oh, I've been around my family. I need to get out. What I'm saying is very simply is that you have to make changes in your life. You have to make decisions in your life to follow Yehoah and the path that he wants you to go down. You cannot allow yourself to be conformed by what is going on around you or what this society wants you to become or how it wants you to think. They do not conform. A leader does not conform for the sake of conforming. They do not do what others do merely because others are doing it. We follow an inner voice, a call. Now, I'm not being spooky about that because remember <clears throat> what your inner voice is going to say. What the word says. So if your inner voice is saying something opposite, <clears throat> take a pill because that's a wrong inner voice. Go come to us. We will have a 
exorcism, if you would, if you're hearing that inner voice and it's really driving you. That inner voice, the inner voice is the word of God that you have, what, meditated on day and night. It's the word of God that you had studied to show yourself approved, that you might know the will, perfect will of God in your life. It's that inner voice, the spirit of God, the Ruach HaKodesh, that is going to call you and lead you and guide you according to that word, that you might come to the destiny and purpose that God has for you. So you don't conform for the sake of conforming. You do not do what others do merely because they are doing it, but you follow Yehovah. A leader has a vision, not of what is, but of what might be. <clears throat> We're going to be cel celebrating 33 years. And, and <clears throat> I would take Gail by this broken down building, and I would say to her, that is our church. That is going to be a powerful church, and that's going to be our church. And Gail would say, <laughs> and we'd go by it, and we'd go by it because it was wrecked, and the, and the glass was broken, and, <clears throat> and drunk people were living in here. Maybe one of you, I don't know, <laughs> in your old life, I don't know. And I tried to get it, and it was like, you know, barriers every which way. But God made a way, that inner voice that said, that's it. And God made a way, and he made a way in finances, and he made a way. And some of you know the story, and some of you don't, but I don't have time to do it right now. But there was a vision, and the vision unfolded. I could have conformed to what people said. <clears throat> it's not good. It wouldn't work out. It's It's trash. You know, my wife said, I don't, think, I don't know. Pastor Kenny, are you serious? But you have to sometimes think outside that box, don't you? We march to a different tune, and I get it that we're a little odd, but we do march to a different tune, the tune that we have in here. <clears throat> when we look at Abraham, that's a different tune. He's thinking outside the box. Can you imagine at the dinner table when he said to his father, I'm leaving with my family. I'm leaving this land. I'm leaving you. I'm leaving what I know. And like a typical father or mother, they would say, what? Where are you going? And he said, I don't know. Well, who told you to go? I heard the voice of God, and he told me to go. He told me to get out, and I have a decision, so I'm getting out. Listen, can you imagine that conversation? You don't know where you're going. You're taking your wife. <clears throat> you're, 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 you're taking people with you. You don't know where you're going. You know what's going on, but you're going to do it. You really need to rethink this thing. So we see here in a very dramatic way in the very first words of Yehovah to Abraham where he says, get yourself, get, go forth yourself. Leave your land, leave your birthplace, leave your father's house and go to the land that I will show you. Why? <clears throat> because people do conform. We have a problem. We conform. Right? If we're not careful, we become like the people that we work with. If we're not careful, right? We conform. How many have best friends and after a while you become like them? Good and bad, right? That's why I think that <coughs> people say that people who have pets, all of a sudden the pets look like the owner. I don't know what happens, but... I don't know whether the animal conforms to them or you conform to the animal. I don't know, but we conform. If we're not careful, if we're not checking ourselves, if we're not paying attention, it is so easy to conform to what is going on in our lives. Hang around people who compromise, you will compromise. Hang around people who don't love God, you won't love God as much. We conform. You don't know me. I'm powerful. I get you're powerful, but we conform. <clears throat> Listen. We adopt the standards and absorb the culture of the time and place in which we live, which is why God said to Abraham, you have to leave your land. You have to leave your land because what is happening to you is that you are adopting the situations of the society. I said to you a couple times <clears throat> last week and the week before and even actually on Wednesday, you know, sometimes we just watch the TV and what we see on TV is against the biblical standards, but we just watch it. And we think it's not changing us. <clears throat> but in reality, <clears throat> years ago, we would have said, that's ridiculous. That is horrible. And we would have turned it off. And today we just say, it is what it is. I know better. And we, we've come to a place where we start conforming. 
there's not that righteous anger that I want all I want God and I want all that he has for me. We are allowing the enemy to kind of pick at our lives, our spiritual lives. In a deeper level, they are influenced by friends and neighbors, which is the birthplace, right? <coughs> Where you're at, who you hang with. You are affected by your friends. You are affected. That's why he says that we cannot be unequally yoked. That's why he says be careful who your friends are. That's why he tells us to, to really be careful who you hang around because they will influence you. And as parents, we have to be careful who our children hang around because they are influenced, especially if you're just a parent who has authority and no influence. Right. And more deeply, they are shaped by their parents and the family in which they grew up, which is why he says you have to leave your land. You have to leave your birthplace and you have to leave your father's house because you can't grow beyond your family if they continue to have influence in your life. Again, doesn't mean that every <laughs> every young person good. I get to leave my family. I was wanting to get out. <clears throat> I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the influence. I'm talking about how you allow people to influence you. And what God had for Abraham was not going to be able to be fulfilled where he was because the land would not allow him to. The birthplace would not allow him to. His father's house will not allow him to. What a great moment when your land and your house and your <coughs> and your um, uh, birthplace allows you to. Right. But we want you to grow up. We want to anoint you. We want you to go out and do great and mighty things. We we want to lay hands on. We want you to go in all the world. We'll we'll take you to Africa. We'll take you to Israel. We'll take you to Ukraine. We'll take you anywhere. But then there is that moment. If we're not careful, we start to conform. All of us have been there. And I've said it before, <coughs> our first mission trips, 40 people, 30 people, 35 people. Now we say, who wants to go on a mission trip? Crickets, 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 crickets. Why? Well, <coughs> again, some good reasons, some bad reasons, but mostly is that we started to conform to our life. And now to do something different is not, ah, man, it's hard, isn't it? To break the cycle unless you want it. So here is Jehovah who is speaking to Abraham. And what is he saying to Abraham? I want you to be different. If, if you don't hear anything else that God has to say to you, listen to what he's saying to you. Be different. Be different than your coworkers. Be different than your family. Be different than how you brought up. Be different in the way that you were thinking. <coughs> be different. Let me take you where I want you to go. Let me take you to a place that you don't even know that you're going to go and that you're going to enjoy it when you get there. But let me take you. And on the way, there's going to be ups and downs and you will you will have successes and you will also have failures. But here's the thing. <clears throat> At the end of the day, I will bring you to the place where I want you to go. But you have to be different. Not for the sake of just being different, but for the sake of starting something new. There's a song we used to sing that says, um, shake, shake, shake. Shake the devil off. Wouldn't it be great that after today you just shook, 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 shook your conformity off. And you said to the Lord, Lord, <clears throat> I'm going to be different tomorrow. And that means my my path will be different. My walk will be different. My thinking will be different. And I'll go wherever you want me to go and I'll do what you ever want me to do. And I'll speak whatever you want me to speak and I'll perform and 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 whatever you want me to perform. Because I'm no longer being conformed to my land and to my father's house and, and to my birthplace because I am breaking out. I want to be what you want me to be. A person that will not worship power and the symbols of power is someone who's going to be different. And that's what God wanted Abraham to do. Abraham was going to birth and maybe you don't like this word. He's going to birth a religion that is different than the world that was around him. I want you says Jehovah. <clears throat> and I not only want you, but the reason why I'm pulling you out, because I want you to teach your children. And the only way to teach your children 
is to make sure they're not influenced by the land. Hello? By the birthplace. And even my father's house. I'm different than my father. You know, if you read the story of Abraham's father, he was going to go to Canaan, but he stopped in Haran. <coughs> Once he stopped there, he decided that was a good place to be, but he was headed to Canaan. But he decided to conform to where he was because it was prosperous. It was a place of power. It was a place of, uh, of, <coughs> of great energy. Um, it, was a, it was a hub. And he said, hey, let me just stop here. How many times do we on our way to where God wants us to be stopped because we arrived to a place of power, we arrived to a place of, of uh, great energy, right? But he says, I want you to teach your children and your households afterwards to follow the way of Yehovah by doing what is right and just. Look at Genesis, Genesis 18, 19. For I made myself known to him so that he will give orders to his children. Why did he make himself known to Abraham? So he give his orders to Why did he save you? Why did he find you? So you can give orders to your children, right? <clears throat> and to his household after him, to the way of Jehovah, and do what is right and just so that Jehovah may bring about for uh, Abraham what he has promised him. To be a Hebrew, to be a disciple, to be a follower of Yeshua, however you want to call yourself is to be willing to challenge the prevailing consensus of this world. To refuse to conform. To be different. To be different has a cost. Because it's easier to blend than it is to be different. Right? You have more friends if you blend. You <coughs> dwindle those friends down if you're different. Right? Right? Even the best friend that you have, if they say no to you or I uh, think you're crazy, uh, even though you appreciate what they're saying, you have a moment of. What? To be a Hebrew, to be a disciple, to be a follower of Yeshua is to be willing to challenge that prevailing consensus. It's 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 the ability to refuse to worship idols. Now, I could ask you <coughs> how many worship an idol and what you would say is, I don't have any statues, I don't have any figurines, I don't have anything, and so I don't actually have any idols. We would actually even say in our lives that we have outgrown <coughs> these idols because that belongs to ancient times. There's no, there's no Buddha in my house. There's no uh, other th you know, things that I have statues of because when we think of idols, we think of uh, you know, these statues and figurines. But what we have to understand in today's world is that idols actually, <coughs> when we think about them, we have to think in terms of what they represent. What does an idol represent? Power. So then my question would be to us, what in our lives has more power than Yehovah? What in our lives have we given over to rather than the word and will of God? Then that is your idol. See, Ra <coughs> was the idol or the God for Egyptians. Baal was for the Canaanites. Uh, Hamosh was for the Moabites. Zeus was for the Greeks. And missiles and bombs are for the terrorists, even today. It's a sign of what? Power. Wanting to take over. We see it in today's society, even with this election. People want power over someone. Power allows us to rule others without their consent. In Greek thought, <coughs> it says, the strong do what they wish and the weak suffer what they must. So guess what? Even as parents, we can be what? Greek. Just do what I say when I say to do it and we'll be okay. You will save uh, flesh from your butt. You will save <coughs> agony in your life. And you will save frustration in me. And we can somewhat curve children with authority. Right? But we need to be able to curve them with leadership by influence. Right? 
Biblical Judaism is a sustained critique of power. When we read the scriptures, what it does is actually it <clears throat> it brings power to a different place. It's about how a nation can be formed on the basis of shared commitment. And collective responsibility. Right. It's this community. I, I, I might have an authority, a virtue of an office. Right. <clears throat> but. We are all working this thing together. We have a shared commitment. We have collective responsibility, correct? So you don't say, well, you're the authority. You're the pastor. You do it. You say it. You whatever. <clears throat> no, you're, you're missing the point of influence. The influence as a leader, I am to join you in doing it, but I am not just to do it. Mom and dad, you are not just to make things happen or make them do it. You are to be part of it, to influence them. Listen, if you don't want them to lie, then stop lying. If you want them to be committed to God, then be committed to God. If you want them to love him with all their heart, then you love him with all your heart. Leadership by influence. We have <coughs> raised people, a children, who is, if the bus goes by, they can get on the bus and go to church. Someone picks them up, you can go. Authority, you need to be in the house. You need to be in church. You know, you know, you go to church. You need to read your Bible. How, when's the, and they won't say it because they want to have their teeth. But when's the last time you read your Bible? See, leadership by influence is it's time to read our Bibles. Let's all read our Bibles. Let's turn this off and all get open our Bibles and we will read our Bibles. Let's all pray. Let me show you how to pray. It's about how to construct a society that honors the human person as an image and likeness of Yehovah. That's what Abraham was leaving to do. <clears throat> he was going to create a nation, a nation where there was shared commitment, a collective responsibility, a nation that was going to serve Yehovah with all their heart, a nation that was going to be constructed and, and honor every single one because every single person is made in the image and likeness of Yehovah. But that meant that every single person wanted to be like the image and likeness of Yehovah. To be a leader, to have the courage not to conform. It is about a vision. How many have a vision? Look, it's here. <clears throat> it's about a vision never fully realized, but never abandoned of a world based on justice and compassion. Listen, you might not ever see it, but it doesn't mean you don't have your vision. Right. Abraham might not ever understand or see the fullness of it. <clears throat> Moses was not able to enter in and see all of it, but it's still not abandoned. You might not see what will happen with your children or what happened with other people or happened with your. But it's OK. Don't abandon. Hold on to the vision. Go forth. You might not ever see it fulfilled completely the way that you want to see it, but continue to march forth. Because one day, according to Isaiah 11, 9, look what it says. They will not hurt or destroy anywhere on my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of Yehovah as a water covers the sea. <clears throat> Listen, this is a crazy society, so I just got to be as crazy as other people. No, you have to be the example of leadership. You have to be the example of civility. You have to be the example of love. You have to be the example of kindness. You have to be the example of compassion. You also have to be the example of justice. You also have to be able to protest what is wrong in this life and what is going on that's wrong. And guess what? You'll say to yourself, I'll never be able to change the world, but that's okay. That's the vision. <clears throat> Fully realize it, but never abandon it. Do all you can to fulfill it in your life. Change your family, change your neighborhood, change this, this kahila. Hold on to it. But you don't know my kahila, how crazy they can be. They are cray cray. That's all right. <clears throat> That's okay. But listen, never abandon it. Abraham, I'm taking you to from your father's land to a different land, a land you don't know. I'm going to lead you and guide you. But you before I start this process, you have to make the decision. And then along the way, you cannot abandon it. No matter what happens, if you get caught in Egypt, if somehow you handed over your wife as your sister. <laughs> Oy vey, God says. <laughs> Oy vey. <coughs> Don't abandon it. 
come on, how many of us would have got caught and then got out of it? And we said, I'm going back to my dad's house. This is, <laughs> woo, this is too hard of a struggle to get to where I'm going. I don't even know where I'm going. Can you imagine pushing your GPS and it says, I like to, and the GPS says, I'll take you where you, I want you to go. Just hang on. So we look at Abraham. Who is Abraham? Abraham, we talked about Noah being a righteous, blameless man, right? No one else was called that. <coughs> and then we see what happened at the end of his life, correct? Right? And he was, he was a righteous man without what? Without influence, without leadership. So, yes, he made it, but he didn't bring anyone with him. And now we have Abraham, who is a man who has leadership with influence, but he has to make the decision to go where God wants him to go and leave the conformity of all that's around him, all that he knows, right? So Abraham, who is Abraham? He is the most influential person who ever lived. The most influential person. You know how I know? <clears throat> because he is claimed as the spiritual ancestor of 2.4 billion Christians. He is claimed as a spiritual ancestor to 1.6 billion Muslims. He is claimed as the spiritual ancestor to 13 million Jews. More than half the people alive. Influence. Now, some are skewed, but still influence, right? Yet, when we look at his life, he ruled no empire. He commanded no army. He proclaimed no miracles. And you never hear him say, Yea, saith the Lord, I have a prophecy for you. Who was he? <coughs> a husband. A man. Who heard an inner voice. Who obeyed that inner voice. Who left his land, his birthplace in his father's house, to go wherever God wanted him to go, along the way with ups and downs. He didn't have an empire. He didn't have an army. He didn't have any miracles. You don't see he raised the dead. You don't see he <coughs> that uh, blind eyes saw and deaf ear. You don't see that. He was not a prophet. He was not Isaiah. He was not a Zechariah. He, he was not a prophetic man. He was just and this is encouraging to us. He was just an ordinary man who followed an extraordinary God and created an ancestor of over half the people in the world who claim him as father. Wow. He is the example of influence without power. It's just his life. <clears throat> See, we say to ourselves, what can I do? I'm just, I'm just a lonely little housewife. I just work at this little job. I'm just a man. I'm just this. I got my own little world. You don't know what you can do if you just allow yourself to be a powerful leader with influence. What makes him different? How can he be this powerful leader without power? Because he was prepared to be different. Did you hear what I said? He is prepared to be different. Are we? Are we prepared to be different? Not for the sake of just being different. But for the sake of following the will and purpose of God. Let me be different the way you tell me to be different. He was called a Haviri, <coughs> the Hebrew, because all the world was on one side and he was on the other. How many ever felt that way sometimes? How many know it's easier to be on the side of everyone else? Never feels good to be the last one picked, does it? You see it going down. Your name's not chosen yet. You're like, oh, please just don't let me be the last one. Because when you're the last one... <coughs> Even though you're going to be picked, you are facing everyone on one side. And you are by yourself. And as bad as that makes you feel that no one wanted you, know this. Yehovah wants you. And he wants you 
on the opposite side. The remnant, the few, right? Not the many, but the few. What we need to say is, I'm glad I wasn't chosen by the world, and I'd rather be chosen by him. And if that means standing by myself, then I'll stand by myself, and I can truly be called a Hebrew, because being a Hebrew means standing all alone. Leadership <coughs> is going to be lonely. Hello. Yet you continue to do what you have to do because you know that the majority is not always right and conventional wisdom is not always wise. So with conscience and courage, so it is with the children of Abraham. We have to be prepared to challenge the idols of the age, the idols of prosperity, the idols of power, the idols of prestige, the idols, the idols, the idols, the idols, the idols. And we have to be able to stand all by ourselves when God says, leave it. Leave it. So we're under pressure today. Right? Right? The power of the pressure to conform. Our young people are under that pressure. <coughs> they're in a schools. They're around people whose lifestyle and thinking process are not the same. And here's the thing about your child. If you are truly training them or trying to train them to the best of your ability, I guarantee you that there are few of their peers that think like your family thinks. Therefore, they will always be the one outside. And if they're not taught that that's the most important because God is the most important, they will go into survival mode. And what is survival mode? To become like them. Nobody wants to die, right? Come on, you know what it is to be a young person. It's hard enough for you now as an adult <coughs> to be the only one that's the opposite. When everyone else wants to go do that, no, I don't do that. Let's go do it. No, I don't do that. You might say, oh, I don't care. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. But you also feel that brunt of what's going on. You feel that isolation. You feel that not wanting, not being a part. And, <coughs> and so you might even succumb sometimes. I'll go with you. Now see how your children feel. And a uh, Society that is completely opposite. Uh, you know, again, I'm telling you, a different society than 30 years ago. Because at least in the circles, you had some families that thought like you. Had morals like you. But we're in a society where morals have gone crazy. Right? So the power of pressure to conform. It can lead us to say what we know is untrue and do what we know is wrong. I know what I'm saying is untrue, and I know what I'm doing is wrong, but for the sake of survival. And we have to teach our children, and we do that through our own influence of our own leadership, that it's okay to be on the opposite side and be all alone. Because this life is short, and eternity is long. And there's one who's never left you nor forsaken you. And that is Yehovah. Yeshua HaMashiach walks with you. He sent his spirit. <clears throat> but more than that, I will also be a leader with you. And as you make good decisions, so will I make good decisions. See, that is why Abraham, at the start of his mission, was told to leave his land, his birthplace, his father's house, to free himself from the pressure to conform. As leaders, we must be prepared not to follow the consensus. Well, it has to be right. Everyone's thinking that way. Oh, well, we, we've known that a long time ago. That ain't right. Remember? The remnant, the few. Warren Bennis wrote a book on becoming a leader, and I... <coughs> I have a quote of his. 
He says, by the time we reach puberty, the world has shaped us to a greater extent than we realize. Our family, our friends, and our society, our society in general have told us by word and example how to be. But people begin to become leaders at the moment when they decide for themselves how to be. We want our children to become good leaders. Not leading in a wrong direction. Right? Your children are not leaders until they have decided to follow on their own the way of Yehovah. Right? The God of who? Abraham. The God of Isaac, <coughs> the God of Yaakov. Why can't he say the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Why not that way? Because he's just not the God of Abraham. And then because he's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and also, no. He has and was the God of Abraham. Then Isaac had a relationship with him and became the God of Isaac. And then Jacob had a relationship with him and he became the God of Jacob. That's why we say the God of Abraham. The God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, <coughs> which is why we want to say the God of Jeff Myers, the God of Ashley, the God of, of Olivia, the God of Judah. We want it to be passed down, right? And how do we do that? Leadership by influence. Yeah, but it seems not to be working. It does all right. Just continue to have influence. You don't know when that influence will turn someone, when that someone will change someone. It doesn't mean that they'll do it right away, right? But they need to continue to see it. They need to see it modeled and modeled and modeled. Even if <coughs> your children are, are crazy, they need to see you modeled it and modeled it and modeled That you continue to love God, that you'll continue to serve God, that he's everything for you. And it might look like they're not paying attention. It might look like they don't care. But listen, they're watching. You have to be willing to be different. You have to be willing to refuse to assimilate to the dominant culture or to convert to the dominant faith. The, the culture is dominant. It's everywhere. In commercials, in shows, in movies, in schools, in schools like Brunswick and Nottoway. <coughs> who the leadership or the teachers are, are told to make sure that they try not to use he and she. Use the word student. Friends. They can't say boys line up on one side, girls line up on the other. They can't do that anymore. Where, in New York City? Oh, in California? Right here. Right here. And you don't think that is causing your child to be conformed when they're hearing it and around it? And if at home all you are is an authority instead of a leader by influence, that's even harder. Right? We have to refuse to assimilate. It's so easy for us to assimilate. And the, and the enemy is, so, is just so <coughs> cunning because he's an angel of light. It looks like it's okay. It looks like it won't matter. It looks like it's just simple. It looks like it's just stupid. No one will, no one will succumb to it. No one will yield to it. But yet we do. This is why. Abraham is called out to create a what? A nation. This is the power of community, no matter how small. Because we should be a community. <coughs> At the end of the day, when we come together, we think alike. Right? It's a refuge. Shoo. I have fought with thinking processes out there. I have fought not to conform. But I can come here and I can do what? I can let my hair down. 
I can relax. I don't have to worry about what you're thinking or what you're saying because what you're thinking and what you're saying should be what I'm thinking and saying. I don't have to worry about <coughs> not offending anyone because we're all in the same place. We all have the same thinking. We all have the same vision. We are the same, serving the same God, loving the same God, and loving each other. Amen. That's the power of community. And that should be something that your children have, a place to come back and say, this is where, this is the norm. Not, that's the abnormal. The reason why there's a community and the reason why God didn't say, Abraham, I'm going to take you and your wife and just do this for you. He said, I'm going to create a nation. Because it's hard to lead alone. It's far less hard to lead in the company of others, even if you are not the majority. So here we are. We're a group of community members that are going to be leaders with influence. So it's easier to lead. Together, right? You have to realize, as I wrap this up, that you are the counter voice in the conversation of humankind. There has to be a counter voice. You have to be the counter voice in your children's life because they're thrown into a society that is different than your voice. There has to be a counter voice. That's the protest I talked about last week. There has to be the protest. No, 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 that's wrong. <coughs> no, no, that thinking process is, not, oh, no, no, you can't be that way. No, you can't think that way. No, 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 no. There has to be a counter voice. What is happening to today's society? Everything is okay and everything is all right, so there's no counter voice because no one's allowed to have a counter voice. You can't tell me I'm wrong without offending me, so you can't offend me. We have to love one another and love who, what they are and love their lifestyle and love what they think. No, <coughs> there has to be a counter voice. If we stop being the counter voice, Where's the voice? Who are they hearing? They're hearing the voice that is prominent and dominant. Well, what can I do? I'm a small voice. Yes, but you're a small voice, and I'm a small voice, and you're a small voice, and if we're together, we're a bigger voice. Right? Which is why it's important that we all think like God. Read the word and believe the word of God, because we don't need counter voices in here. We do not follow the majority merely because it is the majority. We have to be prepared to do what, the <coughs> what th that poet Robert Frost said. What did he say? Two roads. I took the one less traveled by, and that has made all the difference. Really, Pastor? Robert Frost. <laughs> Couldn't you come up with something spiritual? <laughs> well, I did. Because, you know, people don't really say anything they probably haven't already heard in the scripture because the scripture is the foundation. And what does the scripture say? We read it this morning in Matthew 7, 13 and 14. Go in through the what? Narrow gate for the gate that leads to destruction is wide and road, broad. Two roads. One less traveled. Which one's less traveled? The narrow. And many travel it, but it is a, but it is a narrow gate and a hard road. That leads to life. And what happens? Only a few find it. Only a few what? Find it. I find that to be interesting. Not only a few travel down. Only a few find it. Which means no one's looking for the hard way. We just want everything easy. Right? <coughs> We're spoiled. We have microwaves. Right? We have lawnmowers that run. You just sit on, let them take you around. <laughs> Do you remember that old one that you'd have to push and it <laughs> <laughs> Some still have it, but I guarantee you not for not for a hundred acres. <laughs> <laughs> right? It's so convenient now. We're not chopping anything, we're not <coughs> we're not grinding anything on our own. How many would love to have Fresh ground coffee. Yes, as long as I have a grinder. <laughs> Did you? Power's off? Wow. Wow. They put it in a little cloth. Take it to a stone. Is the coffee ready yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Right, go to the river, find your water, bring it back, boil it before you put it all together. <coughs> Take it, go to the cow. Put the cup underneath the udder. <laughs> we, 
we are spoiled. And I'm not complaining. <laughs> Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> you won't hear me say, I would rather be back in them. No, I don't want to be back in them old days. <laughs> the only Mustang I want to ride is one that has four wheels, not hoofs. We'd still be waiting for Allison and Sydney. <laughs> well, they took off on their horse this morning. I'm, I'm sure they're headed kind of like toward somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> Only those who what? Find it. Which means I recognize it. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy not to be conformed. It's not going to be easy to go against the grain. It's not going to be easy to be the fish going against the current. I get it. I understand it. It's hard to be a leader by influence because that means I also have not to conform. The same thing I'm asking for you as a child is the same thing I'm asking for me. Same thing I'm asking you as a congregation, I'm asking for me. Right? <coughs> What's Proverbs 4, 26 and 27 say? Level the path for your feet. Let all your ways be properly prepared. Then deviate neither what? Right nor left, and keep your foot far from evil. Why does he say that? Because he knows where your foot wants to go. <laughs> right? Your foot wants to go where it wants to go. Luke 16. Oh, it's okay. I can read fast. Don't get all nervous. Like, <laughs> Lord, he's going to read the whole Bible. Can you imagine reading the whole Bible? Someone asked him, are only a few people being saved? <laughs> you know, sometimes after a sermon, you're like, so only a few? Am I one? <clears throat> he answered, struggle to get in through the narrow door because I'm telling you, many will be demanding to get in and won't be able to. What did he say? Struggle to get in through. Once the owner of the house has gotten up and shut the door, you will stand outside knocking at the door saying, Lord, open up for us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. Then you will say, we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. And he will tell you, I don't know where you're from. What a, that's a bummer, isn't it? <clears throat> Get away from me, all you workers of wickedness. You will cry and you will grind your teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and all the prophets inside the kingdom of God, but yourselves thrown aside. Moreover, people will come from the east and then the west and the north and the south to sit at the table in the kingdom of God. And notice that some who are last will be first and some who are first. You're not only annoyed that you're outside and you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now you look to the north and people coming and they get in the door and people in the south are coming and they get in the door and then the east and the west and they get in the door and you're still outside. But I ain't with you. Who are you? But I travel with you. I don't know where you come from. Wouldn't that drive you crazy if you, if one of your friends and you were knocking on the door? Hello, who is this? It's Tammy. I don't know you. What do you mean you don't know me? <laughs> D, I don't know you. You just at church with me. I don't know where you come from. Tammy going to your car, get her peg or stick or whatever. <clears throat> You better open the door. You know who I am. I don't know you. That's why they're outside gnashing their teeth. They're so frustrated. But they shouldn't be because they already told them there's two roads, one less traveled. I gave that poem to Robert Frost, he said. <coughs> there's two roads. One is wide. One is broad. All you got to do is conform. Be one of the crew. Grab some peeps and go on your life. Not peeps like peep peeps, but <laughs> peeps like people. <laughs> or you can look and try to find that one and struggle to get in because it's narrow and it is hard. He didn't say it wouldn't be easy. He just said it would be worth it. Choosing the road less traveled is what makes a nation of leaders. That's what's going to make you a leader. A leader by influence. Anyone can be an authority. Just depends who put you there. 
but a leader by influence, that's who God is looking for. And that might require you not to be conformed, to leave the land, to leave the birthplace, and to leave your father's house. Spiritually, it means leaving the way everyone else is living and thinking and acting and living and acting and thinking the way he wants you, your true follower. That will cost you something. Amen? Hallelujah. <coughs> Let's stand before Jehovah. Praise the Lord. <coughs> Children, come. Leaders, come and hold the prayer shawl. <coughs> Leaders by influence. Father, in the name of Yeshua, I thank you and praise you for each child represented underneath this prayer shawl. <coughs> Father, I just ask God that you will touch them, use them for your kingdom, bring them to the saving knowledge of the Messiah as their personal Savior. Father, I just thank you, Lord, that we could be, follow the examples that we need to be and help us, Father, Lord, insert those principles of leadership with influence. Let us be an influence, a great influence, a good influence of how we serve you and love you, <coughs> not in a perfect world nor with a perfect life, but how we always look to you and you are always walking with us. Let us always point them to you and let us point them to you by our life and our works. Use them, bless them, consecrate them. In the name above every name, the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, we pray. Amen. Lift up your hands to receive the priestly blessing. Yehovah, he who exists, know before you presenting gifts and will guard you with a hedge of protection. And Yehovah, he who exists, will illuminate the wholeness of his being towards you, bringing order, and he will provide you with love, sustenance, and friendship. And Yehovah, he who exists, will lift up wholeness of being and look upon you. He will set in place all you need to be whole and complete. May Yehovah grant all the desires of our hearts, fulfill all our purposes and all our petitions. 
May Yehovah, here from heaven, quickly answer all our requests. Save us in the day of adversity. And in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, defend us from our enemies, from poverty, and from bondage. Shabbat Shalom.